Good morning, brothers and sisters, or as I prefer to say, sisters and brothers. We do say ladies and gentlemen rather than gentlemen and ladies, do we not? And not without reason. We are, with God's grace, going to continue looking at the book of Amos. Join me, please, in a, a word of prayer. Our Lord, as we look into your word, we pray that your word would look into our hearts, that you would speak to us, that you would draw us to yourself, that you would change us because we need changing. We pray that your Holy Spirit would move in our hearts, that he would drive us by his power, by his sweet, gentle, great power, from glory to glory, so that we might become ever more like the image of our Savior and your Son, Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Turn with me then to Amos chapter 2. We will commence reading at verse 4. We did study the first uh, section that we'll be reading, but we will proceed from there and put this into context. Again, I'm reading from the Maoz authorized version. This is what the Lord says. For three offenses of Judah, and for four, I will not revoke its punishment, because they have rejected the law of the Lord and have not kept his statutes. Their lies also deceived them, or led them astray, after which their fathers followed. And I will send fire upon Judah, and it will consume the fortified castles of Jerusalem. This is what the Lord says. For three offenses of Israel and for four, I will not revoke its punishment, because they sell the righteous for silver and the needy for shoes. They who long for the dust of the earth on the head of the poor and who divert the way of the humble and a man and his father resort to the young woman so as to profane my holy name. An unclothing taken as a pledge they stretch out beside every altar and in the house of their gods they drink the wine of those who have been fined. And it was I who destroyed the Amorite before them. Though his height was like the height of cedars and he was as strong as oaks, I also destroyed his fruit above and his roots below. And it was I who brought you out of the land of Egypt and led you for forty years in the wilderness so that you might take possession of the land of the Amorite, and I raised up of your sons to be prophets and of your young men to be Nazarites. Is this not so, you sons of Israel, declares the Lord? But you made the Nazarites drink wine. And you commanded the prophet, saying, Do not prophesy. Behold, I am painfully burdened under you like a wagon burdened with sheaves. Escape will be lost from the swift and the strong will not strengthen his power, nor will the warrior save his life. The bow warrior will not stand his ground, the swift will not escape, nor will the horse rider save his life. And the bravest among the warriors will flee naked on that day, declares the Lord. Hear this word which the Lord has spoken against you, you sons of Israel, against the entire family which he brought up from the land of Egypt. You only I acknowledged among the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for all your wrongdoing. Can two walk together unless they have agreed? Does a lion roar in the forest when he has no prey? Does a young lion growl from his den unless he has captured something? Does a bird fall into a trap on the ground when there is no trap? Does a trap spring up from the earth to capture nothing? If a trumpet is blown in a city, 
Will the people not tremble? Can there be a disaster in a city that the Lord has not caused? Certainly the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret to his servants, the prophets. A lion has roared. roared. Who will not hear? The Lord God has spoken. Who can but prophesy? To remind ourselves, God has inspired Amos to prophesy to the northern kingdom, although he himself came from the south. Amos commenced by describing God's punishment on the nations surrounding Israel. And then, drawing closer to home, he addresses the kingdom from which he came, the kingdom of Judah. This is what the Lord says for three offenses and for four. I will not revoke Judah's punishment because they rejected the law of the Lord and have not kept his statutes. God does not hold us to some kind of an abstract ethical standard. He doesn't speak in terms of justice in abstract ways. As we saw and as we shall see, the norms are those established by God. They're not the product of some kind of a uh, social agreement. Uh, they have not evolved over the course of time when men thought what was best for them. Uh, in fact, uh, although there are those who would love to compare the, the law given by God through Moses to the laws of a Babylonian, ancient Babylonian king called Hammurabi, the, dis the differences are so distinct it is ludicrous to compare them. Here is God speaking, holding man and woman, king and commoner to the same standards. Judah sinned against the law of the Lord. And therefore, Judah is to be punished. And then, once again, the Lord turns to Israel. For three offenses of Israel and for four, I will not revoke its punishment. Because they sell the righteous for silver and the needy for shoes, who long for the dust of the earth on the head of the poor, and who divert the way of the humble, and a man and his father resort to the same young woman so as to profane my holy name. And on clothing taken as a pledge, they stretch out beside every altar, and in the house of their gods they drink the wine of those who have been fined. Amos, as we saw last time, draw closer to home. Israel was not to think that it would be in any way excused. Israel is to stand before God in account. Now, there are a number of sins which God, the Spirit, causes Amos to enumerate. First, they sell the righteous for silver and the needy for shoes. They long for the dust of the earth and the head of the poor, and they divert the way of the humble. Second, a man and his father resort to the same young woman so as to profane my holy name, and on clothing taken as a pledge, they stretch out beside every altar, and in the house of their gods they drink the wine of those who have been fined. Third, you made the Nazarites drink wine. And finally, you commanded the prophets, saying, Do not prophesy. Four sins. First, an uninhibited form of materialism that expresses itself in uninhibited immorality with a, a lust 
that causes a corruption of society and of the very worship of God. And consequent to that, a refusal to hear the word of God through the prophets. Did God complain that they did not bring him enough sacrifices? In this case, we can even say, uh, did God rebuke them for idolatry? Uh, no, they did not bring God the sacrifices as his commandment. In fact, they worshipped him where he had commanded that they should not worship him. By means of a priesthood which he did not command. Using a graven images. Yet, here his anger is aroused because society in Israel was corrupt. In other words, it was selfish. It was self-seeking. It was lustful. It was engaged in the enjoyment of life and in the self-promotion of its own concerns, of its own interests, of its own view of the world and of themselves. It was materialistic. And because of that, they conducted themselves as if they will never have to give account to any. As if everything is relative to what they would desire. All that matters is to have a good life, to enjoy oneself, to collect more and more things, stuff. They did not realize that materialism is in fact a denial of God. Because it means that we prefer the things of this world over against the glory of God, over against serving God. How different is our society today from the society to which Amos was sent? The painful answer to that question is, Amos is painfully relevant to us today. Because we live in a selfish, self-seeking, materialistic society that is engaged with loving itself and promoting itself and its own view of life and even of worship of God. How many, how many so-called churches have in, in fact become centers of self or Baal worship? The inhabitants of the northern kingdom were lacking in gratitude by way of an understatement. I mean, God had blessed them so much. He had brought them out of Egypt. He had given them his, his law. What nation had a better law, a more beautiful law? He gave them a land that was flowing with milk and honey. And in order to give them this land, he displaced other nations. He had granted them in Jeroboam the second time a time of amazing prosperity. But they corrupted their ways and they silenced anyone who dare rebuke them. You are offending me. It was the worst sin imaginable. And that is why God is angry with Israel. You see, when we talk about God's holiness, we need to remember that holiness implies certain requirements. He demands of us to be holy. That is to separate ourselves from the course of this world. Holiness is not some kind of a uh, 
a, a mystical or a, a ritualistic or an emotional reality. Holiness has to do with the life here and now. Beware of any kind of teaching that tells you that this world or how we live in this world or how we relate to our neighbors and our, our acquaintances, how we drive or how we manage anything is irrelevant to God. We cannot be holy unless we are moral. And we have no motivation to be moral unless we strive for holiness. That is the only objective grounds by which we can measure anything. The law of the Lord. And so morality is not, is not a feeling, just as spirituality is not a feeling. Morality has to do with, amongst other things, yes, I know it's a loaded term, but I'm going to use it nonetheless. Morality has to do, amongst other things, with social justice. With how we relate to society, the kind of society that we create. And in order to have that kind of society that God wishes, we need to be less exercised with ourselves we need to be, well, to put it simply, humble. Not thinking that the world surrounds us. Not thinking that if we want something, we should have it. Holiness implies self-discipline. Holiness means that God becomes first in our lives. It means that we're concerned for the weak in our society. That we do not take advantage of this weakness. A and I ask, where is this recognition to be found in the average evangelical church? We, we go out, so we say, to preach the gospel. But what kind of gospel is it? Is there a clear recognition of the awfulness of sin and of the fury of God in relationship to sin? Do we dare challenge people to cease self-seeking? Or, or do we prefer the kind of gospel that begins with, you know, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life? I'm talking about the kind, of, the kind of spirituality that is open to self-examination. Not self-preoccupation, but self-examination. A willingness to examine our lives and stand before God. And measure ourselves by the word of God, by the law of God, as Judah was supposed to do, as Israel was supposed to do. Because if we are not, and if we do not, we have no gospel to preach, nor any right to claim to preach it. We must develop a, 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 a lively consciousness of our duty to our fellow men and women. And we must therefore be very quick in distancing ourselves from our sin. It is right to protest abortion. But if all we can do is protest it, we are not doing what we ought to do. We should be seeking ways to reach out to those who are considering abortion. Not only challenging them to stand before God, but enabling them in one way or another to do so. And choose a different course. Amos' words are, are very sharp. They're very clear. And they're rather embarrassing. Let's look at them. A man and his father resort to the young woman so as to profane my holy name. And on clothing taken as a pledge, they stretch out beside every altar 
And in the house of their gods they drink the wine of those who have been fined. This is not just moral promiscuity. This is a kind of embarrassing pleasure-seeking that takes nothing into account apart from the desire to satisfy a craving. And in this case, they do it in the name of religion. Uh, th there's a complete disappearance of any, any kind of moral standard among those who go to a temple, that is to say, to, to worship. Uh, Amos is talking about that kind of um, lusty worship that took place in those days. When, when women served uh, in the temples as, as priests and uh, sexual relations with them was considered uh, a contact with the God. And so a man and his son would come to the temple and lay with the same woman on, uh, beside an altar, all as part of worship. And the, the, the sense of, uh, of, of, of privacy, uh, of, of consideration, uh, of holiness had, had disappeared because their, their spiritual and therefore their moral sensitivities had been dulled. This kind of dulling is always the consequence of any departure from God's word. He says that they do so, so as to profane my holy name. Now, obviously, this is not their conscience intention. Uh, they came to worship. Uh, they had no intention, no conscious desire to profane God's holy name. But those were the consequences. Is the evangelical church known, known for its morality, for its purity, for its humility? We need to recognize that because we bear the name of God in Christ, we cannot sin without profaning his name. And therefore, everything we do will reflect in one way or another on his glory. This is why repeatedly we hear the prophets speak in the name of God and say that the people of Israel, the people of Judah, have profaned the name of God. They've made God's name to be dirt in the eyes of the nations round about. Today, we live in such a period. We don't know the difference between love and lust. Uh, in fact, we, we talk about making love as if, as if that's largely a physical thing. And we therefore make so-called love, what, what society calls love, uh, to be, a, as it were, a standard. But I love her. But I love him. But I love doing this. And this isn't only sexual. I, I have never seen a society with as many obese people as I see here in this country. And I've traveled the world, believe me. I have never seen anywhere so many obese people who simply do not have control of their mouths. Uh, I, I mean, of eating. But it, it doesn't have to do only with these kind of things. It has to do with, well, for example, why we come to church. Do we come to church to, to satisfy ourselves? Do we come to church to enjoy one of the worst things I always hear, I sometimes hear? Uh, I really enjoyed that sermon. I'm sorry. Uh, that's not the point. We're, we're not here to um, 
to cause you enjoyment. In fact, sometimes, perhaps this morning, I, I, my desire is quite the opposite. I don't want you to feel good about yourself. I don't feel good about myself. And frankly, I don't feel too good about you. <laughs> that wasn't a joke. I'm, I'm dead serious. We come to church to hear God's word. And what, what are we going to hear from God? You're so wonderful, I can't help but love you. You're so pure, so gracious, so kind, so affectionate, so honest, so brave. I, I know, we, in Israel, we had a, a sign, a sticker on the car that said, we want Messiah now. And we folk, we want heaven now. Well, sure we want it, but it isn't here. And at the moment, we must struggle with our sins as Israel was called to struggle there, with theirs. They sinned so as to profane God's name, not because they intended to do so, but because that was the impact of what they did. And so it's not enough for us to say, I, I, I didn't intend to. I, I, I wasn't thinking. Well, start thinking. Uh, uh, um, we make excuses for ourselves. As if to say our excuses can cover the consequences of what we do. But they cannot and they should not. And when Amos says that they do so beside every altar, he's trying to give them a sense of the fact that this was, this was a frequent reality. It was a way of life. Amos goes on to say that they drink the wine of those who have been fined. Now this would be uh, uh, an instance in which uh, someone, in those days, they didn't pay with money. They would pay with goods. So in this case, they would be paying whoever uh, they were supposed to pay with wine. And those who enjoyed the wine wouldn't care if uh, this was the last resource that the poor had. So long as they could enjoy themselves. In fact, he, they, he goes on to say that they lay on clothing taken for a pledge. Think of this for a moment. Someone has nothing more to pay for, or to pay with, but his clothing. So he takes off his coat and he hands it over to his uh, cre uh, creditor. And the man takes it and goes up to the altar and spreads it on the floor, because obviously he's not going to sully his own coat, would he? What kind of inconsideration, what kind of moral dullness does this imply? And the scripture says, if you lend money to my people, to the poor among you, and you seize your neighbor's cloak as a pledge, you are to return it to him before the sun sets, for that is his only covering. It is his cloak for his body. What else is he to sleep in? In other words, they are to be very sensitive to the people around them. The neighbors on this side and on that side, on this side and across the street. But they displayed a kind of moral indifference so long as they were engaged in worship. Worship. Hmm. Look what happens. We're, we're talking about this in Sunday school, and it is worth thinking about it. Look what happens when man believes that he has a right to decide how he is going to worship God. and doesn't limit himself to what God himself has commanded. In fact, sometimes even transgresses what God commanded. God commanded Israel to worship him in Jerusalem. Jeroboam set up, uh, set up uh, temples in Dan and uh, in Bethel. God forbade the worship of himself by any graven image. Jeroboam set up golden calves in Dan and in Bethel. 
God commanded that the tribe of Aaron will serve as uh, Levites, or, or, sorry, the tribe of Levi will serve in the temple, and the family of Aaron will serve as priests. But Jeroboam set up a separate priesthood. Now, he, he had justification, political justification. And he excused it with practical uh, justifications. You know, Jerusalem's far for the folk, at least way up in Dan, so they might as well have a local place where they could worship God. And so they built these temples, and they laid these, these beautiful bulls. You go to Dan today, you can still see a, a replica uh, of uh, the, that large altar in the actual city of Dan today. And then they surrounded the worship. I mean, let's make this worship meaningful. Let's make it an emotional experience. Let's reach out to the desires of the people. But what happened was that it, it became not a worship of God, but a, a celebration. You hear of these celebration churches? Uh, a time for, have a good time, have a good sing-along. Now, obviously there, uh, there are matters that are, uh, on which we are free. But there are many in which we are not. The worship of God must first of all be, like our lives, humble. Focused on God and not on man. Focused on the word of God and on his glory. The worship of God should focus on the word of God because that is where he speaks to us. Where we hear him. And the worship of God must be simple. And these three characteristics must also uh, typify our thinking are praying, and everything else we do in church. But Israel diverted from this, and having done so, they found themselves further and further away from God's commandments to the point where worship became an opportunity for lust. Further, the people of Israel made the Nazarites drink wine. Now, they knew from Scripture, once again, that the Nazarites were not to drink wine. So long as they had bound themselves by a vow, they were to devote themselves utterly to the Lord. But that's the problem. They were too, uh, too radical, too extreme. And they set other people on edge by their utter commitment at that moment. I mean, come on, drink a little bit of wine. It'll make me feel better. Uh, why do you have to be different from everyone else? Uh, come on, uh, have a glass with me. But these people, and that's what a Nazarite vow meant, these people wanted to devote themselves to God, at least for a period, in an extraordinary manner. The rest of the people were free to, uh, to drink wine. Not to be drunk, but certainly to drink. But they felt conscious stricken by the radicalism of the Nazarites. It's amazing to see how much Darkness hates the light and tries to turn it off. If there's one boy at, at class who won't use uh, coarse language, he'll be mocked. If there's uh, one fellow worker or, or fellow employer or whatever who will not uh, join us for a drink and another drink and another drink and yet another, then they'll do everything they can to break his will. A student who won't copy, well, he's not very popular. 
Darkness can't stand the light. But we are children of light. And Israel was supposed to be a light to the nations. Peter reminds us that the time has already passed. It was sufficient for you to have carried out the desires of the nations, having pursued a course of indecent behavior, lust, drunkenness, carousing, drinking parties, and wanton idolatries. In all this now, they are surprised that they do not run with you, that you do not run with them to the same excesses, and they slander you. Or as John put it, the light has come into the world, but people love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds are evil. For everyone who does the evil hates the light and does not come to the light so that his deeds will not be exposed. But the one who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds will be revealed as having been performed in God. Sisters and brothers, we need to live carefully. I've said it, I'll say it many times. I need to say it to myself. We need to leave, live carefully, thoughtfully. We must not be threatened by the utter commitment of others, but rather learn from them. Follow their example. And of course, the next step is obvious, is it not? You commanded the prophet saying, do not prophesy. The people of Israel did not want to hear the word of God because they loved themselves more than they loved God. And when faithful prophets arose among them who called them to change the course of life, to live for others, live for God. They commanded them, do not prophesy. Rather, they set up their own prophets who, who prophesied to them the things that they enjoyed hearing. Be quiet, don't disturb my peace. You think you're better than me? I can show you your sins too. Of course. But since when do we hide our sins by those of others? How do we respond when people come to us and challenge us? Not always pleasantly, but how do we respond? Do we choose to take offense? Or do we take the opportunity that someone might even come to us out of, out of unkind motives? I mean, our, friends, our enemies will say to us things that we need to hear and that our friends won't dare to say, perhaps because they know us too well. How do we respond? Do we command the prophets not to prophesy? Do we prefer to be insulted and angry? Do we prefer pleasant, um, affectionate, pampering sermons? Or, or do we really come when we go down on our knees, when we don't go down on our knees and we read the, the, the words of confession, do we, do we really mean what we read? Are we really ashamed of our sins and sorry for them? Do we take the opportunity when we're down on our knees to really examine ourselves? Maybe we should be on our knees more often, not only in, uh, in the course of a sermon or in the course of a service. How, how real, how absolute, how uncompromising uncom are our standards? And how, how willing are we to compromise on them? Is our word graven in stone? Is our A, A, and our nay, nay? Do we 
provide our employers with the best of our energies, the best of our abilities, the best of our time? What kind of values do we inculcate by our examples to our children? Do our lives speak so loud that they can't hear what we're saying? Is the disparity between what we expect of them and what we are expect of ourselves so large that they see it? Do we keep our promises? Do we fulfill our threats? Are we selfish? Are we generous? Or do we, by the way that we conduct ourselves, profane God's holy name to our children, to our neighbors, to one another, to our friends, to our family? Those were Israel's sins. They must not be ours. Those were God's concerns with regard to Israel. They are his with regard to us as well. So let's try to summarize. God requires holiness. Holiness means that we are not engaged with ourselves, but we conduct ourselves according to God's standards, which are not mystical, nor ritualistic. They have to do with the morality of our lives and with the kind of society we create in our families, in church, and in our surroundings. We cannot be holy unless we are moral. And there's no reason for us to be moral unless we learn the fear of God. We must be careful as to what we seek to do when we come to worship. We must be careful as to... We'll be talking about this in the future more extensively, but we must be careful as to how we treat the Lord's Sabbath. This is God's day. It should be sanctified. Can someone tell me what sanctify means? Fundamentally? Set apart. It should be set apart for the Lord. And we should be careful as we come that we do not do not seek to satisfy ourselves as we come to church and are not engaged with ourselves as we devote ourselves to this day. But rather, we should conduct every aspect of our lives to the praise and to the glory of him who called us to himself by his grace. In spite of who we are, in spite of what we have done, in spite of what we will do. Let's pray. God, you know our hearts. Thank you for your word. It's true, sin, sin dwells at the doors of our hearts and lusts for us. And it is so easy for us, it's so easy for me to depart from your ways and to invent all kinds of excuses and um, redefinitions of spirituality and of morality. God, teach us to love you and therefore your ways, your word. And to walk in your ways according to your word. We do love you, Lord. Poorly. But we do love you. 
And you know better than we know how, how partial our love is, how, how faulty, how imperfect. We pray that you will judge us by grace and that you will draw us by that grace ever closer to yourself that we might love you more perfectly, more consistently in the way that we conduct our lives. We ask that you would do this for Jesus' sake. He came to save sinners and we are sinners. We ask this for your glory that we might not profane your name among the nations. Hear us, we ask for Christ's sake. Amen.